Uh, so yeah, my name is Camilo Ortiz, and I'm presenting with uh, Philip uh, how we use uh, Kubernetes in particular to speed up uh, over-the-counter trading. Hopefully, it's a little bit different of uh, what Ed mentioned, but uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, yeah, we've been, we've been in Bloomberg eight years, Philip 12 years, uh, mainly working on NLP and AI applications in Bloomberg. So the idea of the talk, uh, I will try to do like a crash talk on crash course on um, over-the-counter trading, what that does mean, uh, how traders or people in the finance world talk to each other, and Philip will go over why be able to detect security offers in these dialogues is important, uh, and then we'll try to bring it back to the reason of this uh, conference, uh, how do we use Kubernetes in all of this uh, model development lifecycle. So over-the-counter trading, uh, in particular, if you look at the stocks or the normal, uh, I guess, securities and products that are traded and are famous, I guess, among the people that are not into finance, they are normally traded uh, in central exchanges. These are the stocks that are used in our pension funds, uh, the, the, the things that you can trade in your apps. Uh, but normally there's like a central regulated exchange like NASDAQ that you can able, that the people can basically trade and they will see like a single price uh, for everybody to, to check. However, uh, and I'll give more stats later, uh, a vast majority of the financial products are actually traded over the counter or traded in centralized business networks. So the people that trade um, FX, they will have their own social network to, uh, when it becomes too high volumes, to trade uh, for an exchange. Same thing with commodities, mortgages. They all have their own uh, kind of social network where they talk to each other. Bloomberg, in particular, tries to bring transparency to that particular market. And in particular, when they actually talk uh, from one type of asset class to, to another one, Bloomberg tries to connect all of those, but still, most of those prices are if you were in that group chat or in that social network. And that's basically what over-the-counter trading means. It's basically when you have, uh, when people trade any of these financial products and there's no supervision of an exchange. And it used to be in the 80s that you will see traders having I don't know, 10 phone lines and try to talk with everybody and repeat exactly the same offer over and over again. It moved to emails, but it quickly became a spam problem. And nowadays, in the same way that we talk to our family and friends, basically they chat with each other. So some fun facts. Uh, bonds, although if you check this year, it's not going to be the case, but bonds has historically been higher than equity if you add up the market value. And most of those bonds are actually traded over the counter. FX, um, if you add up all of the transactions that, they, uh, that, that traders do against each other, they are normally like 20 times bigger than what equity is traded, the stocks, uh, and the other markets, and they are actually also in their high volumes are traded over the counter. And if you just count the number of things that can be traded in the market, uh, equity only accounts for 1.5% of those things that you could trade, the different, there's only like, I don't know, like 30,000 at most uh, equities that you could trade. And ETFs, but all the other um, uh, products uh, like municipal bonds and structured products where they combine, I don't know, like a bond where I want to hedge against a commodity, all of those are actually traded by people talking to each other. So how do they talk to each other? So here's an example of uh, Alice and Bob, which they want to buy uh, some bond, and Carl, who is going to serve uh, those orders. What's really happening here is that there are two threats happening at the same time. So first, Alice asks for IBM 25s. Uh, Carl uh, gives an offer. Then uh, Alice makes some negotiation, and then Carl can, can go a little bit lower, and then they made a trade. Uh, and that last post is actually legally binding. Like they, are, they, they need to log that into some database so that the government can track uh, that price. At the same time, the other thread is where Bob kind of tags along with Alice and wants to also buy uh, some of those bonds, uh, but it seems that Bob took too long and then uh, Alice cannot meet that price. So you have uh, on this conversation at least two threads, and that's a structure that you can extract from those dialogues. In addition to that, uh, in the first post, we could detect that there's an inquiry intent and there's a particular bond which you need to link, that, that we have a link in, uh, in, in our knowledge bases, of an I, when, it, when they say IBM 25s, they actually normally mean at that point in time, IBM whose coupon, coupon is seven and that is, expires in October 30th of 2029, 
Um, and the size, when they say 10M here in this context, is actually 10 million. They want 10 million of those nodes. Uh, if, we, if, we if we continue, the second post has an inquiry intent as well, but a different size. Uh, the third one gives a quote with a price, then they negotiate uh, more negotiation with a price. A trade is confirmed. Bob tries to negotiate again, but then there's no trade, right? So what happens really uh, behind the scenes? So it could have been that, for example, in, in this other example where that Alice checks the news, checks the portfolio, and wants to get, uh, uh, get some of those bonds. When Bob uh, or Carl, uh, whoever's serving the, the order, uh, gets that inquiry, they check what's their relationship with that client, they check all of their RFQ management, they're getting quotes for or inquiries for many people, and they also see what will be the price that they can give. And they give a price, same thing with Alice, they jump back into their Bloomberg or to their management systems and they check what will be all of the quotes that they're getting because maybe they're not only talking with, uh, with that uh, salesperson, but they might be talking with other people and they will just decide, okay, this seems to be a good price. They make an order. Once an order is made, same thing. They go back and forward from, from one system to the unstructured information that they have in the chat and then a trade is done. Or it could be as the previous example that they take too long and, and it passes. So what we really want and what is really value in doing dialogue understanding in all of these uh, conversations is that most of these traders actually have 200 active group chats <coughs> at the same time. So if we can detect that IBM was mentioned and that it's a bond and that there's an inquiry intent, we can actually make an alert. And maybe the conversation from then on can be completely structured. You can just hand off to some bot that can, that can handle that, that order. So next, uh, we're gonna basically talk about our, what we call MDLC or MLDLC, uh, as Alejandro was mentioning, uh, for security offer detection. And I'll hand off for Philip, he will talk about more about what that problem is. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, so before we actually go into the MDLC, let's talk a little bit about the natural language processing that needs to be performed here. Named entity recognition and named entity linking are two standard tasks in natural language processing. Here's an example. Apple today announced that its board of directors appointed Tim Cook as CEO effective immediately. We can recognize here that Apple is an organization and Tim Cook is a person. That's the recognition part. And further, we can link Apple, the organization, to Apple Inc. in California. So that's a database entry and identify it in, a bit in a database that identifies this entity, Apple. And similarly, Tim Cook can be linked to Timothy D. Cook in Apple Inc. The same kind of named entity recognition and linking you can also perform on the kinds of chats that Camilo just talked to you about a second ago. Here's an example post. Um, where our systems would consider whether, for example, the word F is a ticker or something unknown or something that we don't care about. And it would then link the ticker F to Ford Motor Company in Michigan. Similarly, for 5.291, it could be a price, it could be a yield. Turns out it's actually a coupon, which is a sort of an interest rate. Um, and our systems would be able to identify this as well. And in a similar fashion, um, all words in this post get labeled with some sort of type, and um, all together, this then identifies and um, extracts the trade that is being discussed in this IB post. Here's some more examples. AT&T stock to be sold at $34.5. LOL is probably just traders having fun, but believe it or not, there used to be a Canadian energy company with that ticker. They no longer have that ticker. Um, here's a post um, in which a trader sends an entire table worth of trades that they want to do today. And just to be clear, all of these posts are made up, but they're realistic. Camilo already hinted at, some, at how some traders may benefit um, from alerting capability, for example. That becomes possible once you've done NLP on chat posts. Here's another example. 
What you see here is a table um, where a client can see all the trades that we extracted from their own instant messages and emails. And so in this screen, clients are able to filter, for example, by the bid price or by the ticker and by other things. Imagine, ser imagine searching for a trade opportunity with a price smaller than $94 um, by doing a control F on your inbox. Of course, that's impossible. But once you've done NLP, you've extracted the, tra the trade attributes, you can do filtering, searching, alerting, and that enables workflows that are much richer for our clients and more effective than just working with a um, simple instant messenger. All right, next Camilo is going to tell you about Kubernetes in our MDLC. Thanks. So I will just glance over a, a similar cycle that we have talked about, the life cycle of, the, of how do we build a solution like this uh, in Bloomberg. Um, and it kind of blends with the similar workflows that we have seen in the previous talks. But it all starts with gathering data, right? Um, and to just illustrate the challenge that we have in this case, uh, only a small fractions of those messages or those posts are actually mentioned any of the securities. So a lot of the chatter that they talk to each other is building relationships, right? So how are your kids doing? How uh, should we have coffee? There's a lot of relationship that is happening and every now and then, especially when the market opens, they do talk about this, uh, 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 these uh, securities. So we need, we're forced to have biased samples, but we also are forced to track how what was that bias? Um, the annotation task, as I was mentioned before by Philip, is not easy. Like training annotators to be able to understand those dialogues uh, takes us a long time. It's a big effort to just get a few thousand uh, quality annotations for, for, for a given asset class in a year. And then the sensitivity of this data. So most of these posts and the things that are chatted in these in this, in this, in this groups is information that is actually hinting of how the market is going to move five minutes from there or one hour from there. So this, we need to make sure that the access control and that only the people that have access to, to this data um, are allowed to, to look at it. And, uh, and of course, it's always encrypted and uh, addressed. Uh, building the model, so even if we have perfect data, uh, the NLP task is one of the hardest. It's not only just linking, but it's also a slot filling. Like many offers can be mentioned at the same time, so we need to group them accordingly. Uh, and that without even talking about the threat disentanglement that comes into place. Uh, so it requires a lot of compute for us to get uh, okay accuracies that for, for the client will be okay to automate based on what we detect. Uh, of course, since uh, we're liable on a lot of the things that we detect, we need to be able to reproduce and explain everything that we detect end-to-end uh, -end for any prediction that we do. And uh, for us to be able to train a model and be able to trust that evaluation, we need to account for the bias that came from the samples. And for most of the knowledge bases that we linked all of the securities, actually the securities sometimes only spam for one week. They're for repurchase agreements, our contracts that only last a week, and they might be created within the day. So we need to have a knowledge base that not only can handle that in real time, but when we train the models, those annotations might be from a month ago. We need to simulate the market from, from a month ago. And the deployment, the usual, so a bunch of uh, queries per second, uh, millisecond latency, depending on what's the, the application and how much automation does the client require. Uh, we need to sync the dependencies, of course. Uh, and for any new deployment, we need to make sure that we do better than before, at least for the examples that we were doing okay. So we need the ability to sandbox any new change and compare that against the previous traffic with production traffic. So I'm not gonna go into the monitoring and update, uh, like data drift detection and um, be able to capture the feedback and be able to create new data based on that feedback. It's another set of problems. But the theme of most of this life cycle is that in each, each of these steps, we need to have all of the dependencies uh, for the software and the framework, the hardware, now even how we train our models, change depending on the hardware that we use. And of course, what makes it even more difficult in ML, uh, the data. And that's where we basically rely uh, in our machine learning platform teams to using CRDs to kind of normalize how we do this across. And this model of the learning life cycle not only happens for security detection, but when we want to do intent classification, threat disentanglement, theme detection, summarization, you name it, right? So nowadays we have hundreds of models where it's the same type of problem that as an organization, 
we want to remove those redundancies and not everybody try to solve the same problem uh, of, of, all over again. And that's where we kind of rely a lot on uh, custom resources definitions or CRDs, where for gathering data, we define a way to stream across the company, a way to do batch uh, compute, and of course workflows, especially for example, how we annotate our data, where we need to break down that task into smaller, simpler tasks, like, uh, I don't know, I see a post, is there anything interesting here, and then go to the next level, uh, is there a bond mentioned, and then if there is a bond, then go to another annotation task where you actually uh, annotate all of the slots. Mm -hmm. Same thing with building the model, more batch problems, we have a definition of how we hyper-tune our models, so run a bunch of batch uh, uh, jobs where you can uh, find some objective function that you want to optimize, and distribute, which I guess is another batch problem, a batch job where uh, we basically don't fit the model into one single node, and we need to be able to figure out how do we put that in memory. Deployment, uh, out of all of the CRDs that I mentioned, K-Serve is the only one that is open source, where we deploy our models. Uh, we need to do some regression tests where we compare most, a lot of these K-Serve instances uh, against the previous versions and monitor an update where we want to do some data drift detection and a stream to uh, the data that we think are important to, to gathering feedback. And overall, and this is solutions that I've mentioned with Kubeflow and Argo, uh, eventually we have uh, completely declared all of our model development lifecycle, and if this is our, these are models that are mature enough where we don't need to experiment too much in each of these steps, uh, get into a position where we can actually automate all of this workflow by another CRD that just basically runs all of them. Uh, next, uh, Philip will talk a little bit more deeper into the latest that we've done in terms of building the model for security over detection. Yeah, uh, let's focus a little bit more on that <clears throat> model building component for a moment. Historically, the mode of operation in machine learning has been um, that you would gather a large amount of annotations, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, which in our case would have been annotated posts where a human painstakingly annotates that uh, 10 million, for example, is a ticker, or uh, sorry, is a size, or IBM is a ticker, um, 25 identifies a contract end date. Um, so oh, very, very laborious. But afterwards, um, you can uh, train, uh, say, a recurrent neural network on a GPU farm, and uh, you perform some hyperparameter tuning, and eventually you deploy that model. Camilo mentioned that we have millisecond latency requirements because there's a human sitting in front of a screen and is effectively interacting with that model. More recently, um, there have been innovations that enable you to do with way, way fewer annotations than previously. Um, fewer annotations means less human labor, so that's desirable, and there are other advantages too. Let me tell you how that works. You begin with a large amount of text that could be Wikipedia and other text from the web, for example, and you do unsupervised pre-training of the model uh, which is a task where the model just learns to consume text and produce more text of a similar kind. Next, you take some amount of annotated posts of the same kind that we would have used historically, but way, way fewer, um, and you perform fine-tuning. After fine-tuning, you have a large language model um, that is able to perform the task that we're looking for it to perform, which is identify tickers, identify prices, and other things. But there's a problem. The problem is that large language models are really, really slow. They're big, billions or tens of billions of parameters. And even if you deploy them on a GPU or multiple GPUs, you're going to look at inference times of around a second. That's too much if you have a human looking at the screen, a client especially. One solution is that you can do what's called model distillation. And here, the large model acts as a teacher to a small model and generates training data for a small model. And now the small model is the kind of recurrent neural network that we've been deploying historically, a model with a millisecond latency um, that is good to deploy. Uh, so overall, this lets you work with way, way fewer annotations. Now, how does that connect to what Camilo just said? 
For one, the pipeline um, that we have at the bottom of the screen is way, way longer um, than the pipeline at the top of the screen. And that means that robustness, reproducibility, and the kinds of things that Camillo just outlined become even more importantly. Uh, it's important. Second, you're working with large models. And again, um, Kubernetes and the ability to scale um, work on in multi-GPU, um, multi-machine environments effectively becomes important. So uh, Bloomberg aims to provide highly accurate data, information, analytics, and insights for the global capital markets ecosystem. Human interactions still dominate a significant proportion of that market, the over-the-counter market. And there's an opportunity for AI to make relevant connections between humans who operate in these markets. Kubernetes has been instrumental in enabling us to build robust industrial ML solutions and a reliable model development lifecycle. If you're interested in finding more, finding out more about machine learning infrastructure, do attend the panel that we included here at the bottom of the screen, uh, where some colleagues of ours and other people who are know in this room, some of them anyway, um, will be discussing Thursday at 5.25. Our team is growing. <laughs> if you're interested in joining us, do <laughs> scan this QR code and you'll be taken to a, pay, to a place that lists um, our open positions in the um, AI and ML ops areas. Uh, we also included uh, email addresses of our recruiters here for both London and uh, New York City positions. And uh, we have a blog, tech at bloomberg.com slash AI. AI. Um, and uh, Camilo and I will be around for the rest of the day. Uh, don't hesitate to talk with us during the breaks. We'll be excited to talk with you. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you did the talk and I didn't, right? It was, uh, my summary was not the best, but um, what an interesting problem, right? You know, doing NLP on multiple chat threads seems like a really hard thing to do anyway, but where the stakes are that people are trading tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, you really do have to get it right. So, yeah, really cool use case. Um, we do have a little bit of time if people have questions in the room, so um, just stick your hand up and I'll come around with a mic if you have one. Don't be shy. Okay, yeah, one over here. Uh, yesterday, there was a, a, a panel, or sorry, an entire day focused on Kubernetes and batch, and I'm just, you didn't really go much into details into your, the batch. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about like how you guys, uh, if you're running like batch processing on Kubernetes and what you have found with it. Um. I can answer that. So uh, we basically have our own uh, CRD for batch processing. Uh, so in a way, uh, each of the teams in Bloomberg they have their own namespace where they have a quota, uh, so that they don't, so that we don't, we don't run out of resources. And uh, all of the dependencies are put in a YAML uh, as usual, and then uh, the, the the batch process is is run uh, for Python, uh, TensorFlow, Spark sometimes. Uh, so most of this. Uh, Processes are kind of managed in, in namespaces, and teams share the results of the experiments because they're all running the same in the same shared workspace. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, but we are mostly from the user side. The people that build those CRDs are not, not us. Great. Any any more questions? Okay. Right. Well, let's have another round of applause. I'm going to move by Gay Ivory.